don't be afraid to not be the leader. Hire people who are smarter than you. Leadership is not telling people what to do. And I think oftentimes that's a, a misconception that, well, if I'm a leader, I'm, I'm telling people, no, not necessarily. Take a step back, let people shine. Welcome to the HR L&D podcast with your host, Nick Day, CEO and founder of JGA Recruitment, specialist HR recruiters. Tuning into the HR L&D podcast will help you to discover strategic growth concepts, leadership development strategies, and the values and behaviors that drive organizational change and success. Together, let's empower our workforces, diversify our thinking, and achieve significant HR success. Hello and welcome back to the HR L&D podcast. My name is Nick Day, CEO at JGA Recruitment Group, specialist HR recruiters. Now, whether you are listening to this, excuse me, for the first time, or the hundredth time, or even the thousandth time, let me take this opportunity to say a huge thank you for joining me again today for what I think is going to be a really exciting talk into the world of team building. But before I get into that, and before I introduce today's guest, please let me just say, if you enjoyed the show, please remember to subscribe to it, share it with your HR colleagues, and it would be amazing if you get a spare moment just to leave us a quick review. We are available on all major podcast channels. But on to today's guest, because today I'm joined here by Matt May, founder of Premier Team Building and Interactive Experiences, who offer collaborative programs that design and develop team building and interactive experiences for businesses. He's also the author of the book, Take the Fear Out of Team Building, which is available on Amazon. There's a link straight through in our episode notes if you're interested. And he's a lead facilitator of employee engagement and team building experiences, which has resulted in him delivering team building experiences to clients worldwide. Coming from a theatrical background like myself, Matt is also the co-author and producer of the award-winning theatrical musical comedy, Diego and Drew Say I Do. And today we're going to be focusing on taking the fear out of team building, particularly for new HR leaders. So whether you are working in a leadership role right now, or indeed, if you aspire to be in a leadership role in the future, this is the episode you're going to enjoy. So without further ado, Matt May, welcome to the show. How are you feeling today? Thank you. After that introduction, I feel great. Thanks, Nick. (laughs) Very welcome. Very welcome and absolutely deserved. Let's start with this first question then, something I give all my guests right now, which is this. What does the word human resources mean to you? <laughs> oh, you're throwing me into the fire right away. I am. I, I fully admit I am one of those people that human resources people don't like because my feeling is all you do is push paper and cause problems. Ooh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Human resources. Wow, boy, that really has a different uh, connotation today than it did 10 years ago, doesn't it? Uh, you, you couldn't pay me to run an HR department. <laughs> it, it's managing personnel, really. I mean, if you that's my perception. Uh, obtaining personnel and effectively putting them into their roles and making sure that everyone's happy or at least gets along. And this is yeah. something that you, you've got a lot of expertise in, right? We're going to talk a lot about teams today, making sure people do get along, building good morale. So let's focus on the first bit, which I thought was quite interesting when I came across your book, when I came across yourself all about team team building, which for me has quite a negative connotation. If I was, you know, sometimes someone says to me, Nick, you've got to do, you've got to lead a team building exercise for your team here at JJ Recruitment. I'm like, ah, now I feel anxious. Now I've got to prepare something that's engaging, exciting, relevant. So, you know, this must be something you come across all the time. So what do we do about, about, yeah, I guess that negative connotation that's often associated with the words team building. Right. And and why do people have it? I don't know. Well, I do know. Uh, I, I did a, a big survey this past summer and I put it in my book. Uh, and, and it's a short book, just so everyone knows. It's not 500 pages. It's literally 55 pages of narrative. It's a quick read. So I, I wanted to know why do what do people think? And some of the replies I got were, were absolutely hilarious. Uh, Ugh, roll my eyes so far. They hurt. Uh, hell is real. I don't know if I can say that. Hell is real. Shoot me now. I mean, it, people have very strong negative opinions, unfortunately, and they're more prevalent than the positive. Why? My guess is because people, for the most part, have not experienced effective, positive, collaborative team building programs. How do you do that? Well, I, I, I'm I'm totally going to throw you under the bus now and put you on the spot. You said somebody tells you you got to come up with a team building program and you you get anxious. Well, don't. There's no reason. 
first thing to do, don't try to do it yourself. If you don't have a comfort level and you don't have excessive experience, don't try to put it together because that's one of the reasons people have, and I'm not saying you specifically, no. Nick Day, have put out bad team building experiences, but people have experienced ones where people throw it together or they're not passionate about it or they're apprehensive or they don't know how to really produce a full experience that is positive. That's why I think people have such a negative opinion of the word or words team building. Do you, do you think some of that also comes uh, perhaps because a lot of leadership people in people in leadership roles have often come through because they've been brilliant at their job, but haven't necessarily had the leadership training to be suddenly they're thrown into this realm of leading others. They're great at their job. Now they're going to be great at leading other people. It's not really a skill we get to, to learn. There aren't many coaching courses out there that tell us how to, be, to, to deliver a good team building event. So is, is there a skill gap there in, in those that are being promoted into leadership positions? Yeah, hire professionals. That's the best skill you can do. Sure. <laughs> and I, I talk about that, not whether it's me or someone else. Uh, hire people who do this on a daily basis. Why? Many, many reasons. First of all, I, I'm going to tell a quick story. Yeah. I had a client a few years ago who uh, reached out to me. I said, oh, yeah, I spoke with your colleague six months ago. We, we couldn't make it work because it was the time crunch and the money and yada, yada. But I'm so glad you're here now. How did that one go? And she said, we produced it ourselves. And I said, and how did it go? And she said, never again. And I said, why? And she said, it is way too much work. It is. It's a lot of work. But if you get somebody who knows what they're doing and does it on a, a daily basis, they're, they've already got the structure in place, right? And you brought up uh, leadership. When I lead, and I use that term loosely, when I facilitate a team building program, I don't see myself as a leader. When people ask me, what do I do as far as my work is concerned? I say, I put people who may or may not work together on a daily basis in a room together, give them common challenges, common goals, and let them organically create relationships. That's what it's about. And in doing so, you are going to have people who are maybe stronger leaders take on leadership, and I use air quotes there, uh, roles within the group. And you're going to have people who maybe are followers doing that. But it also could completely switch because oftentimes somebody who is seen or, or normally takes a back seat is going to say, you know, everything you've said works. However, what if we do it this way? And then these natural born leaders oftentimes go, oh, my gosh. Yes, that totally is it. So the roles are are switched and, and intertwined often. So leadership does not necessarily, in this instance, come from training, though I totally understand what you're saying. So using that example, you must have a lot of sort of mic drop eureka moments that happen in these <laughs> sessions that you have. So, so you know, how do you go about creating a positive team building experience for everybody. What, what are the steps that you should recommend or you'd recommend? Well, th they're all in my book, chapter by chapter. But to summarize a couple of them, one of the things I would say is make sure people feel safe. So many people often think team building is zip lining, white water rafting, paintball, or sitting and listening to presentations using slideshows. I don't do any of that. Well, role play. That, role play is another one that builds anxiety, right? Uh, role play and, and trust falls. Trust falls. The trust falls. Oh, yeah, yeah. So what I do is I make it fun. So you forget that you're, quote unquote, team building, right? So make it fun. That's one thing. Keep it safe. So many people always want to say, hey, we're wrapping up a three-day conference. We want to wrap it up and, and do a team building program and send people on their way. Okay, sure. Wait, why do you have hesitation, Matt? Well, this is a group of 500 people coming from all over the globe, right? Yes. They're all salespeople, right? Yes. Some of them have never met each other. Yeah, most of them haven't. Okay, so why do you want to do this at the end? Do it at the beginning. Do it after breakfast the first morning, after your morning keynote speaker. Why? Because if you're putting people in teams of 10, you have 50 clusters and they all know immediately nine other people. So it, they're not, and now salespeople, maybe it's a bad example because they're usually boisterous and, and will go and talk to uh, you know, a chimpanzee if that's all that's in the room. So, but, but you get my point is you sure. automatically have connections with nine other people. Gold medals, we award medals to 
the winning team because competition is fun. It's light competition. Again, I'm not talking about paintball, trying to quote unquote kill people. Light, fun competition. As human beings, we love to win stuff, right? What do we get from an early age in school? We do good work and we are awarded with good grades. May not be the same in the UK versus the US versus Japan, but it's the structure. You're still awarding grades for positive good work. Say so, uh, over in the US, hello, what's the mother of the of the uh, of the prize? The Powerball lottery, right? People play lottery tickets, so people like to win. So if you give that winning team gold medals, hey, wear these the rest of the day to remind everyone else that you guys are the winners, and that automatically at lunch or the cocktail party that night or something, somebody else may come up and say, you guys, we were robbed. We definitely had it, you know, and it just is fun and it causes more communication without the stress of, so what do you sell and where is your office? And right, you're talking- Where are you from? You know, the, the, the standard. Correct. That's another thing. Do it first is one thing I, I say. When I say, oh, do you, are you able to customize it for your company? Does your company sell, uh, I don't know, uh, spaghetti sauce, right? Do you want to do a culinary program where you're utilizing some company product? Or are you doing a training and you want to uh, keep retention with a game show and throw in some company uh, trivia or, or facts that you just have learned maybe throughout the morning? Now, red flag. I facilitated a game show about five years ago now, and it was, I didn't produce it. This is when I was freelancing. It was not my company. I want to put that out there. <laughs> Just a freelance. I out to see the response to this. Go on. And, and it was a, a family feud type game where you had options, right? It wasn't just one answer. It was name something, blah, blah, blah. And the client had all company-based questions. I strongly advise against that. Why this question, literally, we went back and forth between team to team to team. Nobody could get any of the answers on the board. It was very uncomfortable. Ultimately, I think we scrapped the question and moved on. I then relayed that story to another colleague at one point who told me, oh, yeah, there was a story where he or, or another, a mutual colleague of ours did a similar program. Nobody could answer company trivia after 10 or 15 minutes. The CEO stood up and said, this is finished. Everybody go home. So it had the opposite effect, really, of team building. Right, yeah. right. So, again, if you utilize professionals, hopefully they're going to say, okay, I understand you want to put in company content. However, let's pepper it in with pop culture and trivia and history and just some fun things so it's not bogged down and super heavy. So how does an HR leader then remove the fear and anxiety around the words and acts of team building? You've talked about some of the things they can do, but it still doesn't necessarily take away that fear. If I suddenly throw a, a team building event in front of an HR leader now, they've got to go and deliver this to their team to build. And it's, it's a bit like, you know, if someone says, say a joke, or be funny. It's really hard to be funny when someone's just told you to be funny, right? It puts all that pressure on you. And it's the same, I think, with team building. So what are some of the things people can do to, to remove some of those anxieties? You know, it, it, I, I don't want to keep harping on this, but find a professional and work with that person. If you're an HR person, you may not know the industry for which you work, right? You know human resources and people and people management and hiring practices. You may not know about robotics or, or engineering or whatever. So by the same token, HR people, and there's another misconception that I think I used to have is HR people are supposed to know everything. No, they they don't. They don't necessarily know team building and they don't necessarily know uh, uh, sexual harassment and they don't know investigation. They may have a, a handful of knowledge in each, but they're not expert. It's unrealistic to ask them to be experts in all of that. So again, I go back to hire a professional. Tell the professional what you need. This is the number of people. This is where, what we're looking to achieve. This is the group dynamic. This is These are the specs. Um, these are the demographics. We want to include a philanthropic program. We have a CSR mission that deals with children. Based on that, what can you, what can you suggest to me? And the person that you speak to, if they know their nuts and bolts, is going to be able to say, great. Here's what I recommend. Here's three or four different options. This would work well because of blah, blah, blah. This will work well if you want to 
go more in this direction. So again, collaborate with, just like you're asking your people to do, you're asking them to collaborate with each other, collaborate with this professional who knows what he or she is doing and is going to make you look good. Is, is there a minimum team size that this works for? You know, how, how big does the team need to be for this to, to be successful? I have produced and facilitated programs for, I think, eight people is the smallest, all the way up to two, 3,000 at a time. Wow. Wow. Okay. So the, the, the way to take the fear out of it is to give people a strong, positive experience which is going to alleviate the fear and go, goes directly back to what we started with. Why do people have a negative connotation? Because they haven't experienced positive. It, it's like going to a restaurant. If you go to a restaurant and all you get is, is gruel, right? Or hot dogs, it, you, you don't know what a filet mignon tastes like. Well, once you experience that filet mignon, you're going to say, oh, dining out isn't just if It can be a, a wonderful experience. Maybe that's a bad analogy. But. Now, can you give some, let's, let's take that analogy a little bit further. Then. Can you give some examples of some, um, you talked about, you know, we, we, and you're absolutely right. It's the first thing I think of. I think of paintballing. I think of all the things you mentioned before, like go-karting, the standard kind of things. What are some of the, the innovative things you've done for clients on the team building side that, you know, as you said, up to 3,000 people. For me, that's that, that's mind-blowing. But perhaps we haven't thought, not to, not to steal ideas, because I know you've delivered programs all over the world for, for completely different demographics. But what are some of the innovative things that, 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 you, that you've delivered for clients in the past? What do, you, what do you want to achieve? Do you want to do a scavenger hunt? A scavenger hunt is one of the easiest things to do for large groups because you divide people into teams of 10 and you send them on their way. And they either have their packet of paper or they have their tablet or depending upon how high tech it is or whatnot. And, you know, you can kind of let people just go. So if you're in, in London or Berlin or Toronto or wherever, you can kind of let people go. And, and they're sort of self-sufficient, as long as it's really well organized, of course. Sure. You know, you, <laughs> the prep work is exhausting. So that's something. Uh, we, we do everything from fun and games. So talking like uh, beach games, lawn games, to building bridges where people uh, out of nothing but cardboard. And it all has to, to do with physics. I don't get it. I'm not a math and science guy. I just know it works. I know that the materials we give teams lead them to success. These bridges then hold the weight of an entire team of 10. Well, I mean, the, the, each section does, right? And then you can you can decorate the, the sections with slogans or saying in your industry or your company or whatever. So that is, is something we do. We do philanthropic uh, experiences. Building Bikes for Kids used to be the most popular team building program in the US. Wow. It, it still is. Very popular. However, so many people have done them. I think that there's an oversaturation. So oh. I don't see that as much anymore. I hear a lot of, oh, we've done that before. Okay, no problem. Have you done filled knapsacks with school supplies for underprivileged children? Uh, something I learned a few years ago, at least in the US, in most foster care situations, when children are taken out of a home by a foster program or by, by a social services program, they're literally given two garbage bags and five minutes and they say, fill these with whatever you can and we're going. So we created a, a foster care program where we give a big duffel bag and in that is a smaller duffel bag and a fleece blanket that is, that's a knot blanket that people make and fashion their own, uh, teddy bears, toiletry kits, Things that kids, you know, the comforts, if you nice. will, that are really not comforts, they're, they're necessities. So they don't feel like their life is in a garbage bag as they've been pulled away from their family. So that's one thing. Homeless care kids, lots of different philanthropic ones. We have culinary programs, everything from happy hour appetizer programs to full meals where each team creates four dishes indicative of a region. Um, it's, it's, we call it food court face off. We've done it as food trucks where you build a facade of a food truck. And then, so that's like a whole, and I think I did that once the largest I did that was for 850 people, which is a pretty good size group. Um, and then it's also your meal, whether it's your lunch or your dinner or whatever, you get to do a roaming progressive dinner game shows. As I mentioned, we also have uh, interactive theatrical dining experiences. What the heck? That's a lot, Matt. Yes, it is. When we started this company within the first year, I would say we probably had at least a half dozen 
request for murder mysteries. I don't particularly care for murder mysteries. It's just my personal thing. I do have a background in theater, as you mentioned. So I certainly have the contracts, the contacts and the know-how to have created one. But what is a murder mystery? You ask one person and it's, well, it's we go and we figure out who who did it by the actors and the characters around. You ask another person and they say, well, you sit around a table and you have cards and the cards tell you who's who. I would argue, I'm, I'm, I love a murder mystery. The only thing about that from team building is you don't play yourself. So if you're trying to build teams and learn about personalities, in most murders that I've been part of, we say everyone's different, you tend to play a character that isn't you. So I would, I would say that was probably um, going against what we're actually trying to achieve, maybe. And so we we didn't jump on it. But I, I said, well, wait a second. And as you mentioned, I, I co-wrote uh, Diego and Drew Say I Do, which is an interactive wedding experience. And I said, well, if I did that, so I gathered a team together and we have two large, which are our casts of five with additional staff as needed uh, experiences, both with the theme, both with professional actors and characters. And immediately within the first five minutes, teams are playing tabletop games at their tables. And the, um, the camaraderie immediately starts. We beta tested both of them and put people who did not know each other. It was amazing how quickly people who were complete strangers all of a sudden were like, come on, come on, come on. We got to win. We yeah. got to win. And so then we created another series, Dueling Duos, which is smaller, two characters for smaller groups that have smaller budgets. Again, it, that is a whole experience. If you put a, a, a cocktail hour or a half hour in the beginning and then you have a three hour experience with dinner in the middle. That's a full evening. So sure. all of these things get people working and collaborating and having fun. Team building should be fun. It shouldn't be beating a dead horse. This is how you work together as a team. No. Have you ever asked yourself, how can any recruiter understand my HR recruitment challenges? Please don't give up on your hiring challenges just yet. Here at JGA HR Recruitment, we appreciate the difficulties associated with attracting, recruiting and retaining top human resources talent. We also understand just how costly a poor hire can be. JGA HR Recruitment would like to partner with you to help you overcome your hiring challenges. Contact us today on 01727 800 377 or visit jgarecruitment.com to find out more talks a lot of, a lot in there about teams and, and potentially a lot of those events are com competitive you mentioned earlier as well that there's if there's a need for competition as far as you're concerned with the gold medals and it builds i couldn't agree more i also think that for corporates bringing team building experts in like yourself the reason we're doing that is well business is competitive no matter what way you look at it right we're working in competitive environments teams within interdepartmental teams are competitive whether it's against each other or whether it's against a competitor's brand team whatever it is you know if you work in marketing you're competitive you want to make sure your brand is top position over your competitors and i think so i think it's really important that there's an element of competition in a team building type environment from a corporate perspective for that very reason but what have you found in, 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 I'm, I'm making an assumption based on your responses so far that you obviously feel competition is very important in, a, in team building as well healthy fun competition okay not aggressive cutthroat sure. competition by its nature is fun it, again it goes back to we like as people like to win stuff yeah now i really listened to another podcast and i will not say which one it was here in the states and one of the guests said that you don't want happy employees and i'm listening going what i almost drove off the road he's saying no no when you're happy you kind of coast through things and you're not objective and i said i i totally disagree with this guy and he's got a phd in psychology and yada yada but I totally disagree. I think he's taking things to an extreme. My personal opinion. I feel like you can still be objective and do your job well and be happy. So I, I, I admit it freely. I'm a Hallmark movie junkie. I don't know if you have them in the UK, but Christmas time over yeah, here, yeah, yeah. I admit them. And there's one that I actually watched over the summer, Christmas in July. And one of the characters had a line, something along the lines of, Fun is not a typical corporate metric, right? We don't use fun to gauge that. However, fun makes people happy. Happy people are more productive I, in what I found. They're more pleasant to be around. They want to be there. Even if it's just a job, they're pleasant to be around and they want to do a good job. Well, ultimately, that affects the bottom line. So why would you not want your bottom line boosted? And if all it takes is 
keeping your employees happy and doing a quarterly activity where they, after the first one, the first one, they're going to go, oh, we got to do team building. But my goal is by the time you leave, the next time you walk into a room in three, six months and you see this space, you are excited and go, what are we doing today? Cool. I, I agree. I, I think, you know, we, no, we don't measure fun. And certainly HR professionals you know, listening to this probably don't measure fun in the way that you put it. But we do measure well-being. We do measure stress. We do measure metrics that I think feed into feed into that and give us an indication as to whether people are having fun or are happy in their in their working lives. So I think I couldn't agree more with you. I think a fun employee is a productive employee, you know, someone who feels happy in their work. But we most of us spend more time at work than we do at home. So you may as well make that time fun, right? So I couldn't agree more. Now, I mentioned in my introduction, you're also the author of a, of a great book. You mentioned it here as well, which is Take the Fear Out of Team Building. It is available on Amazon. There is a link in my show notes. You can go straight through that and purchase a copy straight away. But interestingly, as you mentioned, it's not actually a book full of team building activities and exercises, which is what we immediately think of, right? And you mentioned some of those kind of activities that, that they're often, we often associate with earlier. So rather, it's a suggestive guide, right? It gives you chapters, it gives you team you know, experiences on how you can plan a great experience using companies like yourself. With that in mind, how does one customize a team building experience then rather than a one size fits all? And this is particularly prevalent for HR professionals. We've got to be inclusive to our entire workforce, you know, regardless of, of, of culture, religion, you know, religious um, considerations. How do we go about creating and customizing experience that, that, that is incredibly inclusive? Customization, like I said, I used the spaghetti sauce example or putting company questions into game shows and whatnot. Yeah. What's your CSR mission? Do, do, do you have, I think I mentioned this, do you have a certain charitable group, whether it's animals or children or veterans or whatever, that you want to help support? Find a team building experience that will, will do that and ultimately yield. You know, the other thing, Nick, is uh, we always give people the option of predetermining teams or if depending upon the size of the group. Now, 3,000, we're not going to do it on the fly at the very sure. beginning. We're going to predetermine it. But what you can do is you can send us, and I'm using uh, any company will hopefully be, do this if they're worth their weight. What we would do is say, okay, you don't want it to be totally random because you have 200 people, or you do want it to be random, but you don't want to have a hand in it because you know your people, right? Send us the list. Maybe it's just an alphabetical list, and that's all it is. Maybe it is broken down by departments. So we're going to say, okay, Sally in marketing, great, team one. And then finance, Joe, and then Nick from engineering, right? We'll pull somebody from each department and we're doing it. We don't know these people. So it's really happenstance. So you get people who are hopefully from different backgrounds and, and certainly different job functions that may or may not interact daily. So you are getting that inclusivity right there. That's, that answers the question, I think. So la last but not least, I think, before we open the uh, hr &D vault, which is, I mean, you've given us so much away already on this, but I'm going to ask a final question. If you had one sort of secret recipe, secret ingredient for making a team building experience fun, and I know it's always lovely to say, be funny, it's really difficult, right? But if there, if there are any secret source sort of things you can give away now, just to, people can take away and go, okay, the one thing we really need to consider if we're going to do this is let's make sure it's fun by doing X. I think we've covered it really in saying competition. The majority of our experiences, I would say all but one that I can think of off the top of my head right now, have a competitive component. We're putting people in teams. So yes, you may not be working with all 50 people in your office. If you have a small office, you're going to be really closely working with nine others. And creating that collaborative. Here's here's an, an example that's in my book, and I, I love to use it because it's happened on more than one right. occasion. I'll get a call from a client that'll say, hey, you did such and such an experience for us nine months ago. Oh yeah, your group was great. We did yada, yada. Right. What's going on? Well, I wanted to let you know how the experience has paid dividends again. Okay. Tell me. Joe from our New York office was on a team with Sally from LA. Until that team building experience, they only knew each other as names and email addresses on the company roster. They had never even met or spoken. So while they were working in the team, they were just talking, shooting the you know what. And, and Sally was talking about an issue she recently had 
within the company. Okay, because yes, you're going to talk about your kids maybe and where you went on vacation, but you're going to start off talking about work. We know that. It's just, it's the common denominator and it's comfortable. So anyway, Joe recently had uh, basically the same problem. He remembered hearing Sally talk about what she did. So he picked up the phone and called her, which I know is a novel idea these days because nobody can do any without a computer uh, in between them, but picked up the phone, said, hey, this is Joe. Oh, yeah. How you doing? How's Sally? Or how's your wife? Blah, blah, blah. They chatted. Joe asked her, can you remind me what you did when you encountered this problem? She told him he used the exact same tactics and solved the problem within an hour, all because they had worked together, having fun building bikes for kids or or building wheelchairs for vets or working in a culinary program, whatever, that was not work-related, even though it was. They just happened to be communicating. And all of a sudden, nine months later, it came back. Let me, let me, let me ask this, actually. It's, it's, it's occurred to me when you talked about picking up the phone and what we're doing now and, and some of the size and scales of activities you've delivered for, for teams. What about the new world of work? You know, we live in a very virtual connected world now if we've got a disparate or not even disparate but a, a business that is is very much remotely based you've now got me still have a workforce of 3,000 but everyone's based in different locations across the world we don't have a central head office have you delivered activities until team building exercises to remote teams and is that possible to deliver successfully yes I will tell you when the pandemic hit I knee jerked and I said oh my gosh we're done well now 18 months later we're not <clears throat> I fully admit I much prefer face to face. Sure. I'm over virtual. I'm I admit I have Zoom fatigue, but it's a reality. I get it. Therefore, as you mentioned, it's more important than ever to keep people connected however we can when they're all isolated and not together. So, what we did what we didn't do is invest $50,000 or more in an app. Why? Because a we knew IT departments were going to say, there is no way you are downloading an app on the laptop we gave you. Don't even think about it. B, many people of a certain age and above are not as computer literate as one might think, which was surprising to me. I mean, simple things. So what we use is we use web-based platforms that don't have the fireworks and the dancing people and the graphics. That's not what is important to us. What is important to us is talent-hosted, interactive, collaborative experiences. So we are very heavily on the game show side. You can do those successfully where you can keep people engaged up to a certain number of people. Once you hit a certain number, you have to break off into two simultaneous games or three or four. After that, it gets to a point where I tell clients it's just not worth it. You're better off keeping everyone together, even if it's 3,000, and doing, for example, trivia with a host, and everybody's playing for him or herself. Yes, we can still have people in teams, so they're they're scoring for their team. They're just not really, sure. they're not talking about answers and whatnot. So, or, or name that tune, we have one the same way. So every person is playing for him or herself. It's a fun break. You see people, it's relaxed. Again, it's competitive, light com- competition. But people are just having fun and it's a nice break instead of the monotony of the Zoom meetings all day. Sure. No, nice. It's a great example. It's a great example. I can see how that could work. Fantastic. Opening the L and D vault. Listen, we're going to open the L and uh, H L and D vault. Some short, sharp, quick questions uh, for you, Matt. So in hindsight, what's the one thing you now know that you'd wish you'd known when you began your team building career? Uh, I would say partnering with the right people. And I guess that goes with any industry, making sure sure that you're collaborating with people who have the same set of values and work ethic so that it's a shared experience. Now, Gwen, we're speaking in HR language when we're talking about values and shared experiences and cultures. That's all good. If you could give one piece of advice to the world to help everyone working in HR right now, what would it be? Don't be afraid of having a good time. You don't have to be a, a stuffed shirt. And I use that term, uh, you know, to the extreme. It's okay to have fun. Hire somebody that knows what they're doing to help you. And let me make you look good. <laughs> yeah, uh, for sure. If you had the opportunity, what advice would you give a younger self just starting out in the world of work? 
don't be afraid to ask for help and find a mentor. And, and that's very hard. That's like you're saying, be funny. Well, find a mentor. Okay. You can't yeah. really you know, call some, Hey, well, can I have five hours of, of your time every week? To, it's an, or, it's an organic experience, you know, a, a thing that happens, but find people that you look up to that can help you and will help you. I think if there's one common theme to all of the podcasts I've recorded over the years for the HR Indie podcast, it's find a mentor is one piece of advice that comes out very regularly. So yeah, you're right on you're right on track with that. And last but not least, what is the guiding principle behavior that you see in every great leader that you've worked with? Don't be afraid to not be the leader. Hire people who are smarter than you and that are <clears throat> going to work with you to elevate the experience, elevate the bottom line. Leadership is not telling people what to do. And I think oftentimes that's a, a misconception that, well, if I'm a leader, I'm, I'm telling people, no, not necessarily. Take a step back, let people shine. Fantastic. Couldn't agree more. Listen, Matt May, it's been an absolute pleasure having an HLND podcast. If people want to reach out and find out more about you, of course, I will keep all of your links in our show notes. Would you like to tell the audience today where they can find out more? Easiest place is at our website, which is premierteambuilding.com. All of the social media links are there and uh, there, there's a contact form there too. Absolutely fantastic. And just to reassure everybody, I will put the premierteambuilding.com link in, in the show notes, along with a link to uh, Matt May's book. Um, there's a couple of social links in there for LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and a number you can pick up the phone and call Matt as well if you wish to do so. So thanks so much, Matt, for joining me today. And of course, if you are an HR or L&D professional listening to this podcast, you need some support with an HR-related vacancy, please do reach out to me or my team at www.jgrecruitment.com or you can give me a call. And again, those links will be in the show notes. Just leaves me to say a huge thank you, Matt, for joining me today on the HLND podcast. I look forward to bringing you the next episode of the show real soon. Thanks, Matt. Thank you so much for tuning into the HR L&D podcast with your host, Nick Day, CEO of JJ Recruitment Specialist HR Recruiters. If you need any help with a current HR or L&D vacancy, then please get in touch with Nick and his team. All contact details can be found in the episode notes. In the meantime, to make sure you never miss a future episode, please subscribe to the show through any of your favourite podcast channels. Till next time.